So this won't be our last uh, message in the law of Christ, but we're getting very close. May have one more next week. It depends on how it goes with, with this one. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to get uh, to the end of this thought, but it's going to be the ministry of the Spirit is going to be our thought tonight. Thank you, Jason. The ministry of the Spirit. And I've, as we've been looking, this, I think this is maybe the ninth uh, message that we've had on it. Um, and, you know, obviously I, I'm not doing exhaustively the book, but if you did want to, to also purchase the book, Charles Leiter, uh, The Law of Christ. And, the, you know, I'm, as far as we're doing highlights of it, but it's been a good book. There's, you know, there's been parts of it that I'm, I kind of, I'm not sure what he means. So if you do purchase that book and read through it, uh, definitely let me know. And I may be able to guide you through some of those things. But tonight, I want to look at this ministry of the Spirit. I love, love this topic. And uh, it's rich. Honestly, the ministry of the Spirit could be a series all on its own. So uh, I pray that the Lord blesses you tonight, just how good he is and how excellent he is to us. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Before we keep going, notice the subject Paul brings up, and it's actually going to flow into our thought, how Christ administered unto us there in verse 3. He brings up the ministry. Verse 4, In such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For, unto, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the, remaining, in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come again thanking you for this day that you have made. Father, may we praise you and, and glory in all of your blessings to us how rich they are, and Father, how many blessings we, we don't even realize that you give us, and that, Father, we just thank you for being on your throne, 
on being sovereign over all. And tonight, Father, I do pray that you'll just bless your word, bless our hearts with the understanding of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've seen repeatedly throughout you know, our study of the law of Christ, the, the main subject that keeps coming up is our Christian conduct. You know, we see a heavy subject on the spirit in the New Testament. You know, it's, it's just the, the thing when the, when the Lord brings the Holy Spirit to you, you're born again, you're quickened. How much we, he has done bringing us from sin and death, condemnation, the, the uh, presentation or the the position, I'm sorry, the, the position of being in condemnation to bringing us to liberty, bringing us to life, bringing us to salvation. Well, there's the, also the aspect. So when you're born again, all of that happens legally, judicially, all of that, justification. But there's also a part where the Holy Spirit plays a role in the life of the believer. You don't have people professing in Jesus Christ as their Savior and not having the Spirit. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. You can't live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit. It really doesn't matter what you say about your own status, but what matters is do you have the Spirit of God within you? And so if you do have the Spirit of God, there is a glorious thing, which, which we are, are going to read here, how we have the ministration of life, not the ministration of death, and that we should walk according to the Spirit. So tonight is going to be heavily involved with that as, as we're closing the book on the law of Christ and the subject of it. We want to leave our study embracing even more the high importance of living our Christian life according to the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Understanding how critical, how important that we live our life yearning, desiring the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life. You know, it, that should be our action and reaction. Not just, you know, on, on Sundays, but every day. Every day we should be striving for the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because those who have the Spirit are to be led by the Spirit. So Paul is bringing up this subject about the oldness of the letter versus the newness of the Spirit. If you look at this in chapter 3 again, I mean our main text is verse 5 through 11 when he brings this up, but I asked you to kind of pay attention. Look at verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So now Paul is talking about their apostleship, their office, which God had called them to be in. Uh, you know, also the pastors, the whoever is ministering the word, but Paul says that they were made by God to be able ministers. That word ministers is diokonos. It's the same word as deacon. It's the same word as servant. So they are servants, right? That's what a ministry is. It's a service. It's a service God has given a person, a man to, or it depends on, you know, how uh, you are ministering. Depends on the qualifications of pastors, deacons, even mothers who teach their children. I, I believe that's also a ministry. And we, we have any way that we are serving God's word. So that is diokonos. That is that word servant. So he first brings up that word, and then look what happens. Well, it's not just people who are serving it is also the Spirit and the law. The Holy Spirit is also serving. The, the Holy Spirit also has a ministry. Well, the law also has a ministry. 
And he brings up the two, and he starts comparing and contrasting. Those who, who say they're saved but want to go back into the legalism, want to go back into the law, want to serve the law, believe that that is godliness, is to serve the letter of the law, and to look no further or not beyond or not even think about the fruits of the Spirit in your life. You just want to do what's legally correct. You don't want to love anybody. You don't want to be gentle or meek or patient or kind or have self-control in your life. All those are fruits of the Spirit. That's the ministry of the Spirit. So Paul says here, you know, as a, as a born-again child of God, we no longer serve after the oldness of the letter, but the newness of the Spirit. And that, that's what he says in verse 6. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now what does that mean? Well, could we, could any of us keep the law? So what was the conclusion of someone who sought righteousness by keeping the law? Well, what was going to be the end of that road? Condemnation. They were condemned already, right? The end of that road is death. Because the law is a whistleblower, right? You've not kept the law. You've not done all that God has commanded you to do. You've fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the end of the law was death because it's condemnation. That's what he means, the letter killeth. Okay, that's what he means. That's the ministration of the law, but the Spirit giveth life. Now the Holy Spirit, its ministration gives life life because the Holy Spirit you had to come through repentance and faith to receive it so it's by faith you are saved verse 7 but if the ministration of death written and graven in stone so you all understand what that means now it's talking about the old covenant was written in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Now we need to remember, it was, there was nothing wrong with God's law. The, it, God's law was holy, just, perfect, good, it was glorious. Anything God touches is glorious. Everything God does is glorious. It was us who fell short. That's why his law killeth. It's not because it fell short, we fell short. And that main point is taught throughout all the word of God. So it was so glorious that they couldn't look at Moses' face because of the glory, which glory was to be done away. And we, being in Hebrews, we saw that, didn't we? And then, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious, more glorious? And for if the ministration of condemnation be glory much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So the glory of the law is fading. The, the glory was glorious. That was of the law. But it was fading only because of how the glory of imputed righteousness excels it. That's, that's what it's saying. Compared to the imputed righteous, compared to the Christ sacrifice and substitute and the, compared to how we're saved we're saved by grace through faith nothing in us no works that which we have done but all works to God and glory to God he's our only champion there are no champions in salvation but one that's Jesus Christ so how much more glorious is that oh it exceeds in verse 9 for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. That's what he is saying. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that remaineth is glorious. So we see a comparison and contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant right here in verses 5 through 11 and in verses 17. Now the, the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty so when the topic of the ministration of the spirit it deals with verses 5 through 11 and verses 17 and 18 the old covenant in verse 6 he called the letter the new covenant in verse 6 he calls the spirit 
The old covenant in verse 6, he says the letter kills. The new covenant, the letter, the spirit gives life. In verses 7 and 8, he calls the old covenant the ministry of death. Well, he calls the new covenant the ministry of the spirit. And remember that word ministry. It's serve. How is, how is it serving? Well, the ministry of the law is serving us in death because, again, we're condemned under the law. But under the spirit, life. The, so he, in verse 9, he calls the ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of righteousness. In verse 10, which was made glorious, had no glory. And in the new covenant, is the glory that excelleth. That which fades away, in verse 11, was the old covenant, but the new covenant is that which remains. In verse 17, the old covenant was the opposite of liberty. And the new covenant, in verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So when we start talking about the letter versus the spirit, I don't want to read a couple things. Paul uh, when he contrasts these two, and I, I agree, he's not talking about uh, biblical, literal meaning versus like symbolic or spiritual meaning. He's talking about serving in the oldness of the letter versus serving in the newness of the spirit. There's the distinction. So when he's saying the letter, and he's, he's talking about the letter, he's talking about the spirit. He's not talking about how to interpret the Bible, whether to take it literally or spiritually, but how to serve, how to serve. We either serve in the newness of the letter or the oldness of the, or the, the newness of the spirit or the oldness of the letter. So it's an external, internal. You, you, you have a principle of works versus a principle of grace. Principle of works is in the old covenant. Principle of grace is in the new covenant. And it's external versus internal working. In the Old Covenant, you could have people serving under the Old Covenant, under the law, and not know God. That's impossible under the New Covenant. You cannot serve in the Spirit and not know God. You have to know God. In the Old Covenant, you know, if you remember his, the, uh, the New Covenant promise in Jeremiah 31, 31, he's saying that all men shall know me. You, no more do you, do you tell your neighbor, hey, know the Lord. For all shall know me. All the ones who are saved shall know him. Under, only saved people are under the new covenant. All shall know him because he's within. Jesus, to the Pharisees, he says, you're painted sepulchers. You, you look great externally. You're all about the external formulism of the law, about the ceremony about, oh, this is what I need to do now. This is what I... And it never comes inside. It's only external. And that is the old versus the new. That's the law versus the spirit. Um, look at Romans chapter 2 with me. Romans chapter 2. Now, we're probably going to spend the rest of the evening in Romans chapter 2 because that is where... Uh, well, not just... I'm sorry, not Romans chapter... Okay, we're not going to spend the rest of the evening in Romans chapter 2, but yes, go to Romans chapter 2 right now with me, if you would, please. And look at verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What is the large subject here, which Paul is expressing to them? Being a child of God does not have anything to do with our outward works. It has nothing to do with our external works. You could just as easily and kind of still get the same idea, even though he's specifically talking about Judaism, couldn't you replace that word with Christian? For he is not a Christian which is one outwardly. 
Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Christian which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. How important it is that unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. If you don't have the spirit within you, it does not matter what you do on the outside. Because you're not a child of God. You're none of His. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, you cannot produce the love that's required in our Christian duty. You can't produce the fruits of the Spirit. You can't do... You know, and Jesus has made this so plain that the same fountain cannot bring forth bitter and sweet water. Didn't he say that? You shall know them by their fruits. I can profess all day long that Jesus is my Savior and the blood covers me and I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. But if I have no expression in my heart, no endearment, there's no Holy Spirit, and I live like the devil, talk like the devil, and I have no remorse, no regret, no repentance, it doesn't matter what you just said. You've not been born again. You must have the Spirit dwelling in you. Now, can we grieve? I'm going to talk about that more. Can we grieve the Holy Spirit? Yes. Can we quench the Holy Spirit? Yes. But when you're saved, you know, I, I like to say there, there's, there was a moment in my life where I was backslidden. I was saved at eight years old. You better believe, I mean, I'm not proud of it. But there were moments and times in my life when I wasn't in church. I wasn't in close fellowship with the Lord. But I had a pilot light there. I could feel it. I, could feel, I knew when too far was too far. I could feel it. I knew better. And I tell you, the more you ignore it, the, the easier it is to ignore. But the Lord called me back. Praise the Lord. He didn't take me, he didn't take me out. He didn't... Um, and he could have. But he allowed me to learn <laughs> through hardship. Like most of us have to learn through hardships um, that there's nothing sweeter in life than your fellowship with the Lord. There's nothing more joyful. The joy's not out there in the world. The joy's with your closet time with your Lord. You know, in, your, in prayer and in, in hope and the joy he gives our hearts. And so we see that Paul is bringing that out. It, it doesn't, it's not outward religion, it's inward. It's an inward circumcision of the heart. That means God has done a work in our hearts. And uh, look at Romans chapter 7, verse 6. Let's just keep going to the right. Romans chapter 7, verse 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And like I said, it's, it's not so much that we're serving, taking text literally versus spiritually. It's we're serving not externally but internally. Salvation's inside out. The inside will affect the outside. What's in you will affect your actions and what you say and what you do and everything else. Salvation's inside out. It's not outside in. Well, if you think of the Lord's grace is outside in, then yes. But we work. That's what Paul says. We work out our salvation. Already having it in our hearts, we work it out. Um, Roman, you don't have to turn there. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Do you have joy in the Holy Ghost? Do you have joy in the Holy Spirit? Oh, I pray you do. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul admonishes them uh, who wanted to go back in the legalism. He says, Having begun in the Spirit... Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So the, the ministry of the Spirit, well, actually, hold on. Let me read one more. Galatians 5.22, you all know this one. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, 
faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and the lust. And here, here it is. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the ministry of the Spirit uh, not only produces a reign of life that we have been blood-bought out of the dominion of sin, out of darkness into his life, but the ministry of the Spirit, the service of the Spirit, also should be producing a walk in us. As we are in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us put in the forefront of our minds the fruits of the Spirit. Am I in love, joy, peace, and temperance, and patience, and kindness, and long-suffering, and meekness? Is that in my in my life. Now, um, do I have time? Romans chapter 8. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to probably um, stop myself from, from going too deep here in Romans chapter 8, but I love Romans chapter 8 when it talks about the ministry of the Spirit. Chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, is he saying that are, you are no longer under condemnation because you're walking after the Spirit? Now, here's the, here's the thing. This is not so much a conditional statement. It is a matter of fact. Those who are no longer under condemnation are people who generally walk after the Spirit. If you're no longer under condemnation, you have the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, you're generally walking after the Spirit. Verse 2. Now, I'm not saying that there's not moments in our life, again, where you get in the backsliding, but it does not affect your condemnation. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, when we talk about the ministry of the Spirit, we are both talking positionally and experientially. Okay? Positionally, well, what happened? We were under the reign of sin and death. Where there was sin, I mean, Romans chapter 5 is full of the contrast between we used to be under the reign of sin and death. We were powerless. We were its subject. We couldn't escape. That's who we were. We were in the kingdom of sin and death. And we, we could not escape. But then, and it's when Romans chapter 5 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We may have been too powerless to escape that kingdom ourselves, but by, by God's power, he came and he rescued us and he brought us out of that kingdom into the kingdom of his dear son. So now we are in a reign of life. We're no longer under the reign of sin and death, but we are positionally in a reign of life and the ministry of the Spirit, not only has he done that, not only has he brought us into sonship with him, but also this walk of life after the Spirit. This walk of life. Um, I've got a whole lot of one to say on that, but we'll, we'll move on. The ministry of the Spirit produces our walk. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Actually, turn over there with me. It's kind of a lengthy passage, but it's an important one. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Well, let me get there myself. My pages are sticking together. and I... <laughs> All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no... Corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, 
but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There's no way to accomplish this in the flesh. We must accomplish this in the spirit. That we yield to the Holy Spirit. We do not grieve the spirit. Christ works through us and flows through us. And what's on our mind is the fruit of the spirits, not the letter of the law, the fruits of the spirit. And that's what it said in the fruits of the spirit. If you continue in that, it'll fulfill all law. So as we are spiritual children, let us be led by the spirit. And it's a full time effort. It's not just a weekend effort. It's not just an on your best behavior effort and how to deal with confrontation effort. Just the church. This is everywhere you go, everything you do. You are a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit. Um, it's directly proportional. As we brought up last week in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, how that it is directly propor proportional with our holiness, with God working holiness in us. He's working his love through the Holy Spirit in us, and it's proportional to living a godly life. A godly living, living godly, is spoken of in terms in the word of God as living by the Spirit. Now, this may seem like a long list, but I, I want to give it to you, so that way, if anything, I can we, we can just... Uh, try to absorb how heavy, how, how much importance this is for us as children of God. As God's children, we are to continually be walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5.25, being led by the Spirit, Romans 8.14, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, sowing to the Spirit, Galatians 6, 8, rejoicing in the Spirit, Luke 10, 21, abounding in hope by the power of the Spirit, Romans 15, 13, praying in the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 18, worshiping in the Spirit, in Philippians 3, 3, being in the Spirit, Luke 2, 27, speaking words taught by the Spirit, Luke 12, 12, obeying the restraints of of the Spirit, Acts 16, 6, being comforted by the Spirit, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, serving in newness of the Spirit, Romans 7, 6, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit, Romans 8, 5, putting to death the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit, Romans 8, 13, being strengthened by the Spirit, Ephesians 3, 16, preserving the unity of the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 3, loving in the Spirit. Colossians 1, 8, having the joy of the Spirit. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, guarding through the Spirit the treasure that has been given to us. In 2 Timothy 1, 14, preaching the gospel by the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, having the joy of the Spirit and listening to the Spirit. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. That was a lot, wasn't it? Do you see how important it is that we live this life being led by the Spirit, asking the Lord to help us be led and guided and, and surrender and yield to the Spirit. So it's no surprise to us that Paul in our text and refers to the entire new covenant as the ministry of the Spirit. The entire New Testament as the ministry of the Spirit. Again, you have to have the Spirit of God in you to live this Christian life as taught in the New Testament. Um, Jesus also illustrates this with the vine and the branches. And I like this, and I want to bring this up, and it won't be long, but John chapter 15, verse 3 through 5, Jesus says this, Abide in me, and I in you. <laughs> if you stop and meditate on that, 
He says, abide in me. Continually abide in me and I in you. Is Christ in you? The hope of glory? Are you speaking as if Christ is in you? Are we reacting to things as if Christ is in us? Because he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, the one thing I love about this, it's a good Bible study or a good word study for you, is that word abide. The word abide, when he says abide in me and I in you, it's not a call to do something, but it's a call to live where you are. If he abides in you and you in him, it's not a call to abide in him. He already abides in you. Now live in that condition. Live where you are. Um, there's a story. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole story, but the, the, there was farmers. It's, it's like a farmer parable. But there were farmers who did not have electricity, and so they powered their turbines and things of that with a waterfall 500 feet high, and the waterfall would come down, and it would, they had a grate there, and then because of the pressure and the power and the force of the water, it would turn their turbine down there at, at the bottom. And ever so often, electricity would start to flicker or get dim and almost just black, like the electricity wasn't working at all. The thing about it was, is so what they had to do was they had to go and they had to check the grate. Because what would happen is things would start preventing that water from flowing down. It'd be sticks or leaves or, or whatever, but little by little. It may have first started with a stick, maybe first started with something that was obstructing it, and then eventually it just got bigger and bigger. Now let me ask you, was the water the same? The water was the same. What was the difference was were the things that were in preventing the water from fle freely flowing through that grate. That's the same thing with Christianity. It's the same thing with being in the Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And we, we can do things. And that's what it talks. Not only is there a positive uh, call that we look out in love, that we follow after the fruits of the Holy Spirit, but there's also a restraining. The Holy Spirit will restrain us from doing things as well that are sin against God. Well, we start allowing the things in our life to start covering that and covering that and covering that, and pretty soon that flow will not be very strong until you have removed the things in your life from quenching the Holy Spirit. I like this poem. Emptied that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand. No power but as thou givest, graciously with each command. Channels only, blessed master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time that we've, you have allowed us and brought us to be together tonight in fellowship and in love and in study of your word. Father, may we just tonight leave this place understanding just the high value, the high premium that, that we have in serving in the newness of the spirit, how that comes under the new covenant. Father, how we are to be lights and around us may be darkness. May we continue to be lights. Father, I ask you to, to bless each one. And Father, just to be with each one. You know each heart. In Jesus' name, amen.